All right, thank you, Randy, and thank you all for being here. Sign by now. Hurtsing Yersen Bayla. In Mongolian, that's thank you all, hello, and thank you all for being here. And I just used all my Mongolian. <laughs> it's much angrier in Mongolian. Well, <laughs> it, it can. It can sound a, a little. But it's a, it's a beautiful language, and it's a, it's a beautiful people. And because of KU's international uh, reputation and focus, I was able to travel there some eight years ago uh, and uh, take advantage of KU's existing links that we had with some Mongolian scholars and students. And uh, the work that, that we initiated there uh, continues with other professors now uh, making contact, younger professors than me, interested in the environmental issues in Mongolia and sort of following in our tracks. And so it's fantastic to be a part of that international tradition at KU to see it going on. And uh, just a little bit about my biography, I got my undergraduate degree and master's degree at KU, and my master's was in Latin American studies. And that's where I learned Spanish and Portuguese and did some of my first international travel doing research. Because my area of specialty is really in the Brazilian Amazon. But again, uh, being able to stay at KU and continue to work on environmental issues, I had this opportunity to travel to uh, Mongolia. And so I want to share with you today, uh, basically, how would I go about teaching students about environmental issues in a place like uh, Mongolia? And so along the way, we'll learn a few things about Mongolia. But the most important thing is paying attention to the approach that I'm taking. Because I know many of you are in, 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 in various areas, from humanities, social sciences, and even in environmental sciences. This particular approach allows you to put all of these things together in a way that we often pick apart when we teach our specific classes, say in physical geography, or in history, or, or English. So with that, uh, I, I want us to do that by linking our everyday consumption, the and things that we're consuming right now in this room, to environmental and social impacts in a place that we think is really exotic and far away, uh, Mongolia. Of course, we'll learn that it's not so far away after all. Uh, the problem that we face, and in a lot of my classes, uh, this is what we talk about, is some basic problems of modernity which, geographically speaking, uh, one of the issues is that we have divided up the world into so many defined, very specialized places with territories. They are so small, including this classroom, that everything that occurs in those places is so specialized that it's really impossible for us to completely trace the links that actually exist between this place and every other place uh, on Earth. And so we become very fragmented, not only in, uh, you know, in our consumption and the things that we do with our consumption, but most importantly, we become completely unaware of the impacts that our consumption has. And so our role then as teachers, I believe, is to really help students develop the tools. There's no way that we can give them every single fact about the impact of their consumption. Uh, that's going to be up to them to, to learn on their own uh, as, they, as they go through life and make decisions about consumption. But what we want to do is give them some tools to help understand the relationship they have through consumption to faraway places that they actually depend on. We demonstrate then how we are connected in this globalized economy through consumption and then to these social and environmental impacts that we, again, are at a distance. And we have to go through a lot of effort to reconstruct what those impacts are, what those uh, links are that we have around the world. Uh, ultimately, only by understanding what those links are can we start developing some ways to critically think about the solutions that are often proposed to solve these problems. So here's Mongolia. I'm just going to give you a very brief uh, geography lesson here. Uh, this is an area of how many Kansases fit in here, do you think? It's a landlocked country. How many Kansases fit in here? Seven? You were right on the seven. <laughs> I had the quick calculations I, I, I did looking, comparing the, the area. It's about seven Kansases. Uh, what's the population of Kansas? About th three million or so. 
same as Mongolia. And about half the population of Mongolia lives where? In the capital, Ulaanbaatar. But that wasn't always the case. This is a country sandwiched between Russia and China, the, the, the culture of which in this particular country and the, uh, the dynasties of this, of this era used to rule a, a great portion of Asia all the way to the gates of Vienna, when you're thinking about the, the reign of Genghis Khan, for example. Uh, but today, confined to this particular landlocked country, uh, I'm not an expert in Mongolian history, but it's a, it's a fascinating uh, example, I think, of expanding and shrinking empire that just goes like this back and forth throughout history and with neighboring peoples, Russians and Chinese, especially more modern times, suffering from a lot of meddling uh, in both directions. And with the uh, end of communism, or not the end of communism, but the, the end of the, the Soviet uh, uh, rule in the late 1980s, uh, Mongolia getting the chance to go through some democratizing processes and begin to open up its markets. This is a story of a country then that for thousands of years has had this very strong traditional life way of nomadic herding. It is one of the few countries today where you can go and find a, you know, half the population still involved in nomadic herding. Uh, following their herds to the, the best pastures, to the best watering areas uh, throughout the country. Um, most Mongolians used to be nomads on this vast steppe of the country. Vast steppe, think of the altitude and environment when you're crossing between Kansas and Colorado on your way out to Denver. About that altitude, and just imagine the, the vast part of that middle part of the country like that in the south, we have the Gobi Desert here, which is an area we'll talk about because this is where uh, some of the most important mines of Mongolia are. And then up here, as we get close to this environment of Lake Baikal, another thing, you have some forests in, uh, in Mongolia as well. But the vast majority is this step. People are herding sheep, they're herding goats, yaks, camels, living off of the materials from these animals, constructing the very homes known as the Ger in Mongolia, and moving along with these herds throughout the country. What type of land ownership uh, regime do you think uh, Mongolians have if they just wander the land? Does anybody own any particular piece of land and stay there? No. Uh, maybe in the cities, yes, there'll be some, some, some private land ownership. But uh, it was explained to me by uh, Mongolians when I was there, you own the land where your gear is, where you put your gear <laughs> and, and the, the pasture around that. But uh, as soon as you pick it up and move on, it's, com it's just fine for anyone else to come along and, uh, and take that. So what about this gear? This is, uh, some people call it a yurt. Uh, how big is it across? Maybe uh, 20 feet at most. Uh, it's got a wooden frame underneath that I'll show you that can be easily uh, taken apart and put back together, and it's covered in very thick layers of felts that are create that are that are uh, manufactured uh, from the animals that these people herd to cover the area. In the very center, you have uh, a, an outlet for the the fire and the stove that you have in the middle, and then the entire family lives inside these uh, these gears. Here is, uh, when I was there, I uh, was able to visit a family uh, putting up uh, a, ger, a ger not far from Ulan Bator, the capital. So it's, it, they, they form a lattice and they can just literally just pull it apart and start forming the walls. Then these poles get wedged in between and then they cover it in the felt. Uh, Genghis Khan probably moved around. Uh, you know, if you're an important person like Genghis Khan, you have your gear on top of a <laughs> movable uh, platform that can take you to visit the vast stretches of your, your empire, pulled by uh, horses and other animals. And what we have, this, this traditional lifestyle of Mongolia, of nomadic uh, living, is under threat today. So the Chinese and Russian influence really weakens dramatically after the fall of the Soviet Union. 
Mongolia begins to open up like never before to the world economy, and with it, what else opens up to the world? Mongolia's resources, its natural resources, which I'll be talking about. And while the world consumes those resources, the environmental impacts, the social impacts, of course, are not felt everywhere. They're felt only in Mongolia. So what I want to leave you with today are some images and examples of the ways in which Mongolia, as a very traditional society, is going through the throes of modernization linked to very intense capitalist pressure to put natural resources on the world market and make so many of the things uh, that we rely on in a day-to-day -day, uh, world. Has, have any of you gone to the Observatory of Economic Complexity website? This is fabulous. I discovered it in putting this talk together. Uh, it's out of MIT, and it pulls, from, it pulls economic data from a number of different sources and puts them into some really amazing visual uh, graphics. Uh, this is the simplest one. It's kind of hard to see, but you can notice the percentages. You guys tell me, uh, what does Mongolia rely on for its exports? Here's 45%, here's iron ore, here's coal, here's petroleum, here's gold, here's copper. Look at the amount. This is 100% here, right, this whole area. So this whole amount all the way to here is stuff that comes from where? From mines. So mines alone, and one of the mines I'm going to talk about is like a third of, of, of uh, accounts for a third of Mongolia's wealth alone from one mine of copper and gold. Uh, you, get the, you get the idea that where is Mongolia's wealth? It's underground. It's underground. What else do, also do we have here? Look at this. A significant percentage coming from animal hair. <laughs> Let's see where that takes us. Kashmir. NPR, I, we're, we're in, in, the, in the, the donation stage for our NPR stations around. I don't know if you've heard. <laughs> I just want to put a plug in for them. They really do fantastic environmental uh, social reporting on a number of, of places around the world, including the United States. Uh, it's a great resource for if you are putting a lecture together. Just go to NPR, put in some keywords. And not only will you find you know, the key elements of a lot of these stories, you'll hear from people that live in these areas. You'll get the voices of people that are going through these issues. And you'll also get some fabulous, no one ever thinks of going to NPR to get photos. But thanks to you know, the web and the internet, uh, these people are in those areas actually interviewing people. And they're taking great photos. So keep that in mind. So Kashmir is an important export product, uh, as you saw. Uh, China, so what are some things that, that lead to that is the fact that China discourages imports of meat and milk. It's right next door, but it discourages imports of meat and milk, but it does allow cashmere. And what China is doing with a lot of this cashmere, it's not producing the 100% cashmere high quality stuff, it's mixing cashmere with other sources of fabrics, plastics, the polyesters and whatnot to create cashmere-like <coughs> products which are much cheaper and selling those on the world market in their, with their textile and fabric industry. What's it basic, in, in any geography class, everything happens somewhere, right, doesn't it? And everywhere is a place, it's a territory. You can actually go there and see what is going on. And in this case, what is all this ultimately based on? Goats and pasture. So here are some goats, this is a picture I took uh, when I was in Mongolia, you can see uh, the grass that they're, they're working on here. These are cashmere goats. So underneath all that really thick stuff is the, is the really fine uh, cashmere that they're going to harvest to use for uh, the, the cashmere industry. And of course, one of the things that we do in environmental studies and geography is we always want students to be aware of the imagery, the meanings that drive so much of the links uh, between you know, moving something from here all the way here in the capitalist economy. Uh, you, uh, capitalism relies on the creation of demand. 
That's why you can be convinced that you really need to buy a bottle of water rather than just take it out of the tap, right? Think about all the things that you are told about how great that water is in the plastic bottle that you just go ahead and grab it when it's probably better just to get it out of the tap. It might even be better for you. Um, well, what are the imagery, what's the imagery that gets Kashmir moving across the world is things like this. The, global, the Gobi Mongolian Kashmir Company is a, is, a, is, a, is a stop that every tourist has to make before they leave Ulaanbaatar. You'll get the, the cheapest, nicest looking uh, jackets and sweaters and scarves that you can imagine. So here she is, a uh, Mongolian woman. Is this a modern Mongolian woman or is this a traditional Mongolian woman? It's a hybrid, it's a hybrid isn't it? <laughs> it's a really interesting hybrid. She's got the horse here, the saddle, uh, but uh, looks like she's probably ready to hit the town um, with the horse. <laughs> Uh, here she's in a little, that looks a little uncomfortable to me, but evidently uh, the ad agencies in Mongolia decided this was a great way to sell uh, some of their product. I want to take a moment and just show you guys some YouTube videos from Gobi because it also uh, emphasizes this and gives you a little sense of how it is around the world. All right. He did a great job, don't you think? <laughs> he just needed that cashmere coat. Uh, to give you a sense of, of the sound of Mongolian, uh, I want to play this next clip. Uh, I don't know what they're saying, I'm sorry, um, and there's no subtitles either, but we can imagine. This is the, what's called their, their ad for their Nadam collection. Nadam is the uh, famous uh, summer festival in Mongolia where a lot of uh, traditional games are, are practiced for, for spectators and for people that, that, that spend a good part of their year training for these few months when it's warm and you can uh, do archery, uh, you can do the traditional Mongolian wrestling, etc. So this is the Nadam collection and uh, a great way to listen to this beautiful language. Right, who wants to buy cashmere? <laughs> who doesn't? It is beautiful. And it, I've received gifts of cashmere, and it is. It's, it's one of my favorite uh, scarf that I have. All right, so with that, here's NPR. How your cashmere sweater is decimating Mongolia's grasslands. And here, we trace the consumption of cashmere to the social and environmental impacts of the cashmere. This is a story, a re really recent story, just December uh, 2016. And th in this particular story, there's some fabulous photos too that I'll share with you. So here's a, here's a, a typical uh, group of, of herders that, that these reporters uh, came across in Mongolia and interviewed them. Uh, they mentioned how uh, they mentioned a number of things about the changes in the Kashmir economy uh, and some interesting things about the, the, the very goats themselves that show how you really need to put together a picture of political economy, but also an understanding of uh, ecological understanding of goats and, and pasture to really understand what's going on here. Like I said, they, they, Mongolian herders have a, a, a wide variety of animals that they interact with. Yaks, camels, uh, cattle, uh, goats, sheep, and things like that. Um, of all of those animals, which is the one that breeds the fastest? <laughs> goats. They're already predisposed to, if the conditions are right, they're happy to reproduce. Um, and you can get a lot of them really quickly. And so many of these people talk about how their herd of goats in particular has increased so dramatically. Uh, they still keep some of their inner animals for consumption. That doesn't drive their economy, uh, but mainly for uh, consumption. So as these goats move across the landscape, uh, what's limiting them is, is good forage, is good forage. And so uh, after, what do you know, uh, those of us that know something about goats, uh, what are they really good at? 
eating vegetation, and they'll, they'll, the, 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 their mouths and their lips and their, the, the way they forage, they rip up uh, grass from the roots uh, and eat the roots as well. Why not? Uh, that's where a lot of biomass is located in these, uh, in these more prairie steppe ecosystems. And so you can't have them grazing in one area. Luckily, with a nomadic lifestyle, what do you do? You just pick up your gear and move to other pastures where there's some water available as well, because they need water. Uh, their hooves are unlike the hooves of some of the more traditional animals. Uh, these are very sharp hooves, and the goats are very good, especially during the winter, of digging in. Instead of letting the, the, the grass recuperate a little bit during the winter, they're digging through ice, they're digging through snow, and getting just as easily to uh, whatever vegetation uh, is available. And so this is what a lot of areas in Mongolia are turning into. Uh, there's just no vegetation left. What else might exacerbate, put on your, your physical geography uh, thinking cap with me, what else might exacerbate uh, the loss of grass in this area? Not just the animals, but what else is going on? Climate change. And so uh, there's a water balance in every place on Earth. The evaporation and uh, precipitation and runoff are all balanced. And so if you increase the temperature of this area just a little bit, what happens to the amount of evaporation? It goes up, and that means less water available for the grass. And add to that all the goats coming through here, eating and trampling and getting rid of the grass, you can get into a situation where the local environment becomes drier and drier and drier, where it, it can pass a tipping point where it's going to require major change on a major scale in terms of climate and economy for grass to be able to reestablish itself in this particular uh, area that's so devastated, this particular one here. Again, this is from the NPR story. Fantastic imagery. This is better than National Geographic. So what are the negative consequences? Summing this up, goats are already breeding faster than anything else in the herd. There's high market demand. So what's going to happen? Their numbers are just going to skyrocket, these cashmere goats. This leads to overgrazing and unsustainable practices. Even with this low population and with the ability to move across the landscape, there's no fences. You just move along. Uh, tremendous numbers of areas are experiencing this kind of problem. Uh, climate change may worsen it, and then when you add to uh, you know, these, these families in these rural areas are getting a, a, a decent amount of cash. Their income from these are, is going up, but that doesn't mean that their, you know, life is easy. Uh, the hard winters that can come in Mongolia, known as the dud, can uh, come in and with fluctuating prices for cashmere, it makes for a volatile livelihood. These people have always had volatile livelihoods, some years better than others but they've been able to make up for that by moving to where they need to be. Uh, when we're, the concern I have is that when you become so dependent on a particular product, and where is most of this cashmere going? It's going to China. Uh, that is where you become then dependent, and if anything happens in the Chinese economy, all of a sudden uh, you're, you're stuck with a bunch of hungry goats, right? And that's not a good situation. All right, next product. Everybody get out your phone. <laughs> this, is, this is what I want to talk about right now. We all have them. Almost all of us have them in this room, at least. And uh, this is the, the, the iPhone 7. Nice image from Macworld. You ever think about what goes into an iPhone, a typical iPhone? Scientific American helped us out by making a periodic table of the elements of the iPhone, <laughs> which is a, a, an interesting way, an infographic, interesting way to remind us that uh, basic rule of geography, everything happens somewhere, and everywhere is a place. So just because you have your iPhone and you, you feel connected and that it doesn't have any environmental impact, well, it comes from somewhere. I won't even try to pronounce some of these uh, rare materials. Yttrium, presidimium, gadolinium, terbium, etc. Where does this come from? These are rare earth minerals. Uh, they come from these mines. And if you look at uh, 
you know, these, uh, the, and the various ores that come out of this, right? None of those are found in, in very pure form. They have to be refined. Uh, and so most of the mines uh, are really going after copper ore first, iron ore, coal, uh, and gold is a, is a really important uh, component, too, of, of iPhones uh, and a lot of the electronics that we have. So let's talk a little bit about what this, uh, where these kinds of things come from. Oyu Togoi is one of the most uh, controversial and complicated mines in Mongolia. It's in the southern Gobi Desert near the border with China. It involves a, a conglomeration of Canadian and Australian mining companies. And uh, with Mongolia entering that world stage, entering that global economic stage with such valuable resources, Mongolia has had to figure out, how do you deal with these guys? How do you deal with these very powerful, well-connected uh, companies uh, that represent uh, customers for their ore across the world? Uh, it's required Mongolia to think about new legislation because what is Mongolia concerned about? What, what are going to be the things Mongolia is going to be concerned about entering into contracts? Mongolia, they're, they're herders. They don't have the expertise to go in and mine something. So they need those outside companies. But what do they also, what are they concerned about? there is going to be environmental impact. So we'll need to, for the first time, come up with some environmental legislation that talks about before you build a mine, what do you need to write up? Some type of impact statement. How are you going, what are the impacts going to be, and how are you going to mitigate those? What else? Taxes. Yeah, we can't let you leave with these minerals and, and, and not leave something economically valuable here. So what kind of agreements are these giant mining companies going to be willing to make, how valuable is that copper and gold and coal and everything else to them to also leave, to have some type of profit sharing uh, with the company, uh, I mean with the, with the country. And then once the country starts getting all this money and these taxes, then it becomes, well, if you do have a, a surplus, and now Mongolia finally is ha bringing in a lot more money than they're, than they're spending, what do you do with this? What do you do with this extra stuff? How do you, quote unquote, develop your nomadic <laughs> country? Uh, I, I th I'm not sure uh, what year it was, but they are beginning to cut people dividend checks. Uh, you know, a couple hundred dollars. Everybody gets a couple hundred dollars uh, coming from mining profits. Uh, very controversial because of the environmental impacts. Uh, I was able to go to the Oyu Togoi uh, company one day and talk to a representative. Uh, luckily, just the week before, some environmental protests had ended, and it was possible for people to <laughs> go up and, and visit people in the office. So it attracts a lot of national and international attention. And these kinds of issues are at the heart of a nascent Mongolian environmental movement, uh, which is very interesting. The images, right? When you come into Ulaanbaatar and you travel down the road to from the from the airport to downtown, these are the images. Uh, so this is, uh, I presume, Liber is a is a uh, machinery company. Uh, welcome to Mongolia. <laughs> uh, progress creates success. Uh, success creates progress. I'm not sure which way it goes, but this is one of the main images that you see coming in. And so this is what drives a lot of the mining. It's, a, it's progress. It's bringing in money. Uh, we will move from you know, this, this, this traditional nomadic country into a fully uh, integrated capitalist money-making uh, country for our people. So it is a tremendous undertaking in these very large uh, mines. Uh, one thing we think about a lot in environmental studies and geography is the actual energy. What are the inputs that actually go into getting stuff out of the ground? So you're thinking about amazing amounts of petroleum to run these machines. Uh, but you also need a lot of water. You need a lot of water in mining. Wouldn't be so bad if all of this water that's used, pumped from groundwater, 
into these mines if it were used over and over again. Unfortunately, it's not. The easiest thing to do is what? After you know, you're flushing water through a particular area, just let it run on downstream. And so uh, there's problems with that. Uh, so, so this is, uh, uh, we use Google Earth. Uh, Google Earth Pro is, is available now for free. In all of your classes, I encourage you, it, it's user friendly. Design experiments or issues or problems where you remind students, whether you're in a geography class or not, everything happens somewhere and everywhere's a place. Google Earth is a fantastic way to go in and find these places and even investigate change over time. They've got the, uh, the bar at the top, the, the slider that you can actually take from the most current image and slide it back, have students describe the changes that they see. There's photos that are attached to it. Uh, and other linked websites that, that a student can quickly, through Google Earth, do a research project uh, and, and present their work. And in the process, they're basically learning a lot about uh, geographic information systems because that's what Google Earth uh, Pro is. It's a geographic information system and it's very user friendly. Uh, and it's a fantastic way in today's world that people can upload uh, information that then becomes available to everyone. And so I really encourage you to do that. This is just the Oyu Tolgoi complex uh, that is officially started uh, around it. And if I'm not mistaken, because I've seen this on some other Landsat imagery, uh, some of these areas that you see here could be, these lighter areas, could be areas of uh, so-called illegal uh, artisanal uh, mining. And so one of the big concerns is you have enough trouble controlling the environmental impacts of something like this. Imagine the hundreds and thousands of mines that Mongolian private citizens and even smaller companies without permits and things like that start going in because they know in that area that ore is really rich and uh, doing mining. Uh, you can measure how large these things are and uh, get students uh, interested in, in what's really going on uh, in the world with these. So summing up mining's problem, mining's problems, uh, all of these rare earth metals are used in electronics like cell phones. Uh, for the Mongolians, it is a tricky issue because they do not have the skilled labor, uh, either at the level of engineers uh, and the people that know how to do mining, uh, that know how to do environmental assessments, uh, or the workers themselves that know how to go into these mines and operate these machines and actually work. Who does? The Chinese, and they're right next door. And so Mongolia has had to allow, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pretty, uh, in a fairly, I don't want to say it's entirely, but a fairly mono-ethnic population, has had to uh, bring in former enemies, the Chinese, to come in and uh, provide much of the labor. And so there's lots of social issues that occur in these growing mining towns, uh, the Mongolians versus the Chinese in some of these areas. Uh, the environmental and social concerns, we talked about the, the, the water use, the water quality. Once the water is used, it can simply be uh, thrown back into uh, the hydrologic system and washed downstream. Uh, how is this going to disrupt traditional lifeways? So you're a herder around these areas. What, what's happening now to the water that your livestock are drinking? Poisonous in some respects. If the tailings are not uh, uh, cared for or put back into the earth properly. Uh, also, uh, you know, the, the amount of traffic that starts to occur out of these places not only affects uh, the herds themselves and, and diminishes an already shrinking habitat, but it also uh, makes it difficult for the, the, the people living in these areas. The, the amount of dust, the amount of noise, all kinds of things. Mongolia is struggling to figure out the best way to uh, develop its country in terms of infrastructure to connect the, the west with the east, the north and the south. Uh, China and, and, and Russia uh, dispute where the development should be. They want to have links to Mongolia. And so should we build more north or should we build south? And Mongolia seems to be settling, we're going to build a cross. We're going to build a giant highway and railroad systems that really connect 
uh, across Mongolia, and then we'll work from there. And one of our uh, researchers in uh, geography, Alex Diener, is uh, currently involved in a lot of projects to try to track the changes that are going on across Mongolia as this east-west corridor is being constructed. Really exciting research with uh, interviewing uh, the people living along these areas and doing uh, photography with drones. Really interesting work. Um, any other problems people can think about before I go on with the, the mining? You can see how it's linked to the, the herder lifestyle. It's going to disrupt in, in many of these areas. Yeah? The big billboard you showed us, Welcome to Mongolia, it was in English. Is that, I mean, that's not like traditional mining. No, no. But uh, you know, for Americans and things coming in, it's the it's the it's the uh, it's the international language. So, so. So in a sense, you're almost creating a social hierarchy then too. You're not having an international language. Yeah, but welcome is pretty easy, you know, just like Rutsen, Irsen, right? <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, you see a lot of. I mean, especially in Ulaanbaatar, it's an international city. You've got people coming in from from all over the world there, especially with related to these, the, this mining. But that would disrupt the traditional language. Yeah, but, but again, in, in, in any international capital, you're going to see English everywhere. And, and it's, a, it's a common uh, thing that people do lament, is like, you know, you go to a shopping mall and what do you see? Subway. Mm -hmm. You know, Victoria's Secret. Uh, really? You know, uh, and people lament, you know, why don't we have our own stores? Why don't we have our own name on these things? So um, I want to I want to end here really quickly uh, bringing up this idea of what is it? What are the culture? What's the symbols now with a, a so-called modern Mongolia that will guide it uh, as it navigates these these issues of confronting the global capitalist economy but also living with some of the problems that it's generating. Um, they've done it, I think, with uh, this idea of the modern nomad. You saw the woman in the, in the Gobi ad, uh, and some new national icons and heroes resurrecting Chinggis Khan as, a, as, a, as an important national symbol, which was not always the case in Mongolia's uh, recent history. Uh, Chinggis Khan, let's kind of put him off to the side. But now, no, this is a sign of strength. This is a sign of forward-looking progress. Um, and then, of course, consumerism, development, and progress being part of that. One of the famous restaurants in Ulaanbaatar is Modern Nomads. <laughs> let's just own it. <laughs> uh, we're struggling to, with these issues. And uh, for people that come into town, uh, we're, we want them to, to be a part of this transition from the nomad to the uh, modern uh, Mongolian uh, life. Sukhbatar uh, Square here, just some of the, you know, uh, heralding Mongolia's past, while at the same time more and more uh, high-rise uh, buildings uh, going up around the city. This is the, the, the fairly new uh, palace there, government palace, uh, at Sukhbatar Square with Genghis Khan, uh, right at the center there. This is, this is what Mongolia is, is about. Let's build a giant steel Genghis Khan statue outside of town and attract tourists there. Um, you can come out, uh, do I have a pic? No, I didn't, but this is really big. <laughs> Uh, here, these people, uh, some foot for scale, but that's still a ways off. And then you climb up. I can't remember whether you go up the leg or back here, but you actually come out right there. Can you see the people up there? It's big. It's big. And a beautiful view of, of the, the steppe around that area, not far from some of Mongolia's national parks that surround Ulaanbaatar. So there's also Chinggis beer. So you can always get your Chinggis beer. Uh, and I didn't find the ads for that, but I can imagine what they would be like. Probably you can become more manly if you drink, if you choose Chinggis beer. Uh, so again, this idea of progress is so prominent there. So Ulaanbaatar today, it's really growing. I mean, it only has 1.5, it has half of Mongolia's population, but it doesn't have the capacity to take in new people. The infrastructure of the city is still Soviet era. Uh, and so the gear districts, people are bringing their gears and, and just plopping them into any place they can find in, in the city. Uh, there's got to be some issues cropping up. And I talked with uh, 
with uh, um, hydrologists and water quality experts that are expecting some groundwater pollution problems. So again, go to Google Earth and you can see the different patterns of settlement. Here are the urban center and then in other, some of these other areas that look a little bit more irregular, those are the Gare districts. Everybody's <laughs> coming to town to the edge of town and establish their, their Gare and they bring their animals. How does a nomadic lifestyle, bringing in your animals to the outskirts of an urban area work when being the more modern nomad, you're stuck in little enclosures like this. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable at all. Uh, this is what they look like up close when you're in the middle of traffic. Uh, the Mongolian education minister that I met complained about traffic in Ulaanbaatar. People drive around like they're on their horses uh, in Ulaanbaatar, he told me. Uh, but Again, uh, here's the, the river Tul, which comes through the city, where a lot of the water comes from in the city, along with groundwater. People get their water, often, even in the urban area, by going to a, a well in the city that, that they go in and they can get their, their allotment for the day, uh, right next to a, you know, a gas station that is doing oil changes, which has me a little concerned. So uh, I leave you with this picture of, of reality that uh, with uh, Mongolia's uh, growing economy, its, it's attempt to live more modern lifestyles, uh, we are steering together, really, through our integrated economy, Mongolia, into a distinctly different direction. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to understand our part in that and do whatever we can to uh, find ways to make that transition as good as possible, both for people and the environment in this part of the world. Thank you.